We are honored and privileged to have a very full agenda today with guest speakers to look at the role of international courts and tribunals um, as complementary and cooperative with one another and with domestic and regional systems. We will have perspectives from civil society. Um, we are honored to be joined um, by um, Ambassador and to uh, the permanent representative of, of Switzerland to the Netherlands. And we also have esteemed experts um, and legal scholars. Uh, this event is brought to you by Citizens for Global Solutions, um, which is a nonprofit, profit, nonpartisan organization founded in 1947 with the goal of free, just, sustainable world predicated on human rights and the rule of law. Um, and also the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. And both of our organizations collaborate as co-conveners of our Impact Coalition. And Impact Coalition is um, a coming together of civil society groups in the lead up to the Summit of the Future this year in September. And this Impact Coalition on Just Institutions and the International Court of Justice um, is advocating for the universality of the ICJ, um, as well as the universality and effectiveness of the International Criminal Court and other judicial institutions. I'll allow my co-moderator moderator to introduce himself and say a few more words of a welcome and introduction. Alan? Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, my name's Alan Ware. I'm originally from New Zealand, but now I've been living in Europe for the past decade, uh, and I'm the program uh, Director for World Federalist Movement, Institute for Global Policy, um, and our main focus is on uh, building better global governance for current and future generations. Uh, and uh, we are very happy to be part of this uh, today, this event today, which is the first of a series of conversations on global justice and international law and institutions. Uh, this is the second session. The first session uh, this morning uh, was time for participants uh, best in the Asia Pacific region. So we focused a, quite a lot on historical cases, particularly from the International Court of Justice that have been successful uh, and have been, had impact uh, in, in the region. Um, also an overview of the current cases in the International Court of Justice and a look at how the International Court of Justice can protect the rights of current and future generations. Uh, in this afternoon session, or to this, this session, session two, uh, we're looking more broadly um, at uh, international courts and tribunals with how they intersect International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court plus some of the other tribunals uh, and in particular looking at how uh, these are able to take forward uh, the important aspirations to prevent crimes of atrocity and ensure accountability for crimes of atro atrocity. Uh, we will have available video recording of session one if you weren't able to make it because, of course, it's a different time zone. Uh, and uh, we look forward to your participation in the ongoing work that we're doing uh, to advance uh, the legal approaches, uh, the, use, the important use of international law um, and the judicial institutions, the judicial, judicial bodies, to be able to resolve international conflicts peacefully uh, and prevent atrocities. Uh, we have a, a, run, a line of very uh, esteemed uh, experts uh, in the area of international law, uh, and so we'll have a chance to listen to them, and then some time at the end uh, for questions and answers. So please use the Q&A box in order to put your questions as we're going along, and we'll look at those and then refer to them after the speakers. So now I'll introduce our first speaker who is uh, Ambassador Corinne Ciceron Bula, uh, who is the ambassador of Switzerland to the Netherlands. Uh, prior to this role, uh, she served as the head of the Directorate of the International Law in Switzerland's Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, um, and so has been involved particularly on the legal aspects. Uh, she studied law uh, with a law degree at the University of Freiburg and an LLM in European Law in the College of Europe. And then is, um, in between uh, the graduation and then her work now as the ambassador, she's also worked in diplomatic roles for Switzerland in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Brussels and Israel, and has represented Switzerland as an agent in legal cases, including in the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Ambassador Cicerón Bula, it's a great honor uh, to have you here with us and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. It's, uh, it's also a pleasure to be uh, with you all uh, today uh, and to share the, the opening remarks on this very specific and important uh, topic. 
As you know, uh, UN Charter requires states to uh, solve their conflict in a peaceful way uh, so that international peace, security and justice are not endangered. And we could uh, notice that since the first uh, principal judicial organ of the UN, ICJ, was established in 45, we have seen a lot of new uh, international tribunal uh, um, being created in the last decades. Some are dedicated to a specific conflict like uh, Kosovo Specialist Chamber or the, the, uh, the court also for um, Central African Republic. Public. Some other are competent on specific uh, part of international law, ICC for criminal law, um, ITLOS law of the sea. And we have been facing an unprecedented number of, uh, of cases in front of the ICJ, being contentious cases, be it uh, um, provisional measures or also advisory uh, opinion. Now unprecedented, three advisory opinion at the same time. And so this increase of cases show um, the importance of the work of, uh, of ICJ, especially in a time where the geopolitical uh, situation is, uh, is more tense than earlier and uh, when the Security Council uh, is uh, often blocked. And uh, ICJ can be seen as a last resort institution in order to achieve and to continue evolving uh, in direction of peace and, uh, and security. But when we look at all these different uh, international tribunals, the question is how uh, or how is their inter uh, relationship between them? And some delimitations are quite clear because uh, if you look at IC ICJ, uh, ITLOS, they refer to state responsibility and ICC, uh, Kosovo Specialist Chamber, rather to individual responsibility. So we tick the box, it's clear. But then the delimitation is much more complicated if the same conflict is being tackled by different uh, international tribunals, though through different uh, legal questions. But then there is the question, how is the impact of one uh, decision to the other? Uh, are the, they influencing their respective works uh, through uh, the facts they have uh, considered as, a, as, a, as, a, as final? And another inter relationship element is the personal resources, because you often see a judge of one uh, an international uh, court being then elected in a, a more universal court. We have uh, witnessed uh, judges from uh, Kosovo Specialist Chamber, but also European Court of Human Rights being elected in uh, ICC. So we see that the inter uh, a connection is uh, is quite high, but as I'm not an, uh, coming from the academy, I'm coming as a state perspective. I would rather uh, like to focus why should states support uh, international courts and tribunals. The standard response is they commit to. Uh, uh, while uh, being part of uh, the UN. Okay, it's not very persuasive. So um, there, there should be also other responses. And uh, they also um, have a direct and specific interest in, uh, in supporting uh, international court, having more security, also more legal security, and uh, uh, setting a, a clear framework for, for states. It's, uh, it's also clear that... Uh, also, Switzerland being a small country, we have a, a very a clear interest uh, of an equal treatment of all states, no solution being based uh, on the right of the strongest. But lately, I also noticed another additional element, because uh, with a broad recognition of uh, uh, the jurisdiction of, uh, of international courts, you reduce the number of cases where there is a, a negative uh, competence, uh, conflict of competence. Sense. And I mean, when there is no uh, uh, tribunal uh, which is competent for, for a specific situation. And uh, facing this situation, states are uh, committing a lot of energy and resources trying to fill in the gap. And then um, on the ground, the situation continues, uh, victims remain on their own, and the fight against impunity uh, is not going forward. And uh, the situation for the negotiation for the tribunal on uh, the crime of aggression in Ukraine is, uh, uh, illustrates well this situation. So how states could support more effectively international court and tribunals? 
First, according to me, uh, they have the responsibility to elect competent judges, uh, and I'm referring to their legal, but also to their managerial uh, competences. Uh, second, they, they have also uh, to allocate sufficient uh, financial resources so that the court can uh, execute its mandate. But linked to that, it's also important that the court itself has a, an efficient management of, of resources because you can't, uh, due to the financial situation, it's not that you can just add every year some millions, the, the court has also uh, to be uh, efficient. And states can also do some uh, outreach because we have seen uh, uh, 74 states recognizing the, the compulsory jurisdiction of ICJ. It's not not a lot is uh, in comparison of 193 uh, countries. And uh, in that field, uh, Switzerland was active and uh, launched a, a handbook on accepting the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice with other six partners. And the idea is to present some practical example of a declaration, uh, also special agreements to submit a specific uh, uh, situation dispute to, uh, to the court. And uh, I'm convinced that uh, even if this handbook was launched 10 years ago, it's still very uh, a jour because this uh, formulation are, are still useful today. And uh, uh, in the end, why is uh, such a uh, conversation as today uh, important? For me, it's important because we all need to have a better understanding of the respective international ju uh, judicial institution, their competences and also their functioning. And uh, it helps also to identify potential duplicates or gaps uh, in order to develop new ways of improving uh, the whole system. And uh, states are important, but uh, they are not the only actors in, uh, in this field. Uh, civil society victims have also a very important role to play in increasing uh, this, um, this uh, fight against impunity. And uh, in the end, we all have a common interest, but also a common responsibility, which is to improve the peaceful settlement of dispute, but also, therefore, our own uh, security. So I'm looking forward to hear all the, 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 the next speaker and uh, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Um, and here uh, I would like to uh, draw attention to the chat. We have some resources, including the handbook uh, that are being shared there. And I'm also very pleased to see you introducing yourself and honored that we have such an esteemed group of participants with us today. We look forward to the discussion with all of you. Um, the initiative that the ambassador mentioned, led by like-minded states, is supported by a new campaign called Legal Alternatives to War, Law Not War, that the two of our organizations, WFM, IGP, and Citizens for Global Solutions are pleased to co-lead. We'll have the opportunity to speak more about that, hopefully in the discussion, um, and how everyone can be involved. But for now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend and mentor, Professor Jennifer Trahan, as our next speaker. Jennifer is a clinical professor at NYU's Center for Global Affairs and director of their concentration in international law and human rights. She is an internationally renowned expert on issues of international law and justice, and a prolific scholar, having published two jive digests on the case law of the ad hoc tribunals, as well as scores of law reviews, articles, and book chapters, including on the International Criminal Court's Crime of Aggression. Her recent book, Legal Limits to Security uh, Council Veto Power in the Face of Atrocity Crimes, received the 2020 Book of the Year Award from the American branch of the International Law Association. She serves as one of the U.S. representatives to the Use of Force Committee of the International Law Association and holds various positions with ABILA, the American branch of the International Law Association. I could keep going with your bio, I think, for the rest of this session, Jennifer, but in the interest in time and knowing that you will have to leave us before the end of the session, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and thanks for that super kind introduction. I'm delighted to be on this panel. Thanks to Citizens for Global Solutions for inviting me. So I will very much continue where Ambassador Bula left off, talking about enforcing 
um, what Citizens for Global Solutions has termed atrocity crimes, which I take to mean genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And periodically, I will also bring in the crime of aggression, which I also think is an atrocity crime. I, I don't know if everyone defines it that way. So as mentioned, we have the level of individual criminal responsibility through our international and hybrid tribunals, ICDY, ICDR, ICC. Then we sometimes have prosecutions in um, individual states. We often refer to these as universal jurisdiction, although they're sometimes based on other territorial bases. So we've seen states, Germany, Argentina, and then we have the level of state responsibility, and that's at the International Court of Justice. We've seen, as mentioned, um, a huge amount of more activity recently with Gambia's case against Myanmar, South Africa's case against Israel, Ukraine's against Russia um, and others. And of course, there's also the human rights framing, um, because when you have atrocity crimes, you're also violating human rights. Um, so that is kind of a whole different um, uh, area that can be pursued as well. So, you know, why do we have these different levels? Well, um, when torture occurs, it is simultaneously a crime. It is, we have an individual perpetrator, an individual victim, but there is also state responsibility, such as in the torture convention. And then you can take that kind of case to the International Court of Justice, assuming there is jurisdiction. So I'm optimistic that we have these multiple ways to um, pursue these kinds of mass atrocity crimes. And I think um, in the last couple of decades, we've evolved significantly um, that really citizens around the globe, they they demand justice for these crimes. They, they are aware uh, of these tribunals um, and they want to pursue it. So I think there's a huge expectation and you know the challenge is to meet this. Um, money damages is kind of a separate area. Often our tribunals don't grant money damages and sometimes that can be a, a very key priority for victims and often has to be pursued through a separate proceeding. So to be a little more concrete, let me talk about some of the ICJ cases. Um, we started kind of off in the recent years with Bosnia versus Serbia. Now, Bosnia didn't get the ruling it wanted that Serbia was complicit or aided the genocide in Srebrenica, but it did get the ruling that um, Serbia had failed to prevent the genocide. And there's very powerful language in that state in that case talking about this obligation is on all states parties to the genocide convention, a due diligence obligation to do their utmost in the face of um, what is occurring. And it's based on their effective power, their capacity to influence. So a more powerful state is going to have um, higher obligations. Um, we've seen the Gambia versus Myanmar case. This is for genocide against the Rohingya brought on behalf of the Islamic Conference of States. Um, and, you know, this is interesting because it is, um, I mean, it is also very important to pursue this, but um, it's, it is brought um, not because Gambia, you know, suffered, um, had its citizens um, suffering a harm in Myanmar, but based on the common interests of all um, in enforcement of the genocide convention. So um, that is significant. And so far the ICJ has issued provisional measures order saying the government must take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of genocide and ensure the preservation of evidence. We also have the ICC, ICJ case brought against Syria for torture under the Assad regime brought by Canada and Netherlands with similar provisional measures orders granted. Now, these cases I highlight, I think they're particularly important because these are situations we're having trouble getting individual criminal responsibility for. So for my Anmar, the ICC does not have jurisdiction over into Bangladesh. So it'll be a forced deportation case. It will not be the genocide case. Um, so it is crucial that the ICJ pursues this. Um, Although it's no substitute for individual criminal responsibility, but state responsibility is still powerful. Syria is the same situation. The ICC has no jurisdiction. The referral to the ICC was vetoed. Um, there is no tri tribunal with jurisdiction over the crimes in Syria as a whole. So it's really reliant on universal jurisdiction cases. And that really, um, you know, maybe a handful of cases. So I think it's in in very important we have the ICJ level. Um, at the ICJ, we also have South Africa's case against Israel. 
um, for alleging genocide in the Gaza Strip. So far, they've only issued a provisional measures order saying the claims were plausible. They haven't reached their merits ruling um, and have issued provisional provisional measures. Um, and there is also an advisory opinion at the ICJ on the legal consequences arising from the policies and practices of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem. And this is another way the cases reach the ICJ, which is generally hearing state versus state cases, but only based on consent. Another way is advisory opinion questions referred by the General Assembly or the Security Council. In that case, it was a referral from the General Assembly. We also have a case bought by Ukraine against Russia. And this is an interesting use of the Genocide Convention. It, it's a case brought for a declaration there was no genocide occurring in the east of uh, Ukraine against Russian speaking populations because Russia had used this um, as an argument for its invasion. So Ukraine uh, cleverly went to the ICJ um, to get that uh, claim debunked. Um, and we also have a provisional measures order, importantly, 32 states intervening. Um, these are all important questions that I think aren't otherwise going to, uh, are, are different from um, what is otherwise being pursued. The ICC is looking at the Israel-Palestine situation, and you will see has issued warrants for war crimes and crimes against humanity charges that's not duplicative of what the ICJ is doing. And similarly, the ICC is pursuing um, war crimes, crimes against humanity charges in Ukraine. Um, it's a different focus. They're fo forced, uh, focused on crimes um, being committed um, by Russian forces in Ukraine, focused on um, crimes during the invasion, as well as supports deportation of children. Um, again, different. So I don't think we're seeing any du duplications. Um, and then, of course, we have all the work of the international tribunals. I won't go over these, um, uh, the different tribunals, but I will highlight, I think when we the Rome Statute was first um, enacted, we thought, well, we won't need any additional tribunals. And we're now, I think, in a different phase. We realize the ICC can't do it all. I highlight there's a Central African Republic. They have a hybrid um, where in negotiations, um, Ambassador Bula referred to for a special tribunal on the crime of aggression against Ukraine, that would be a freestanding. So there are times where there are, are issues that aren't coming before the ICC. Um, we may still have additional tribunals. And I have mentioned universal jurisdiction, but this is much more of a one-off. It's, it's so much um, dependent on who travels where, um, whether a former torturer um, is spotted by a diaspora community and they go to the authorities. So that is um, a little bit, um, um, I'm not saying it isn't important, but it's not a holistic look at justice. It's more we found one individual who needs to be prosecuted. So I've highlighted a bit of an overview of the system, and I'll just point out a few gaps where we need to do better. So one, I'm going to start with the crime of aggression. So despite the severity of the invasion and all of the crimes that we've seen being committed, um, there's a gap in jurisdiction. The ICC does not have jurisdiction over um, non-state parties such as Russia. Um, so this is a, a, a gap in the system we think needs to be fixed um, by a Rome Statute amendment. And I'm headed over to the UN to speak on that topic to states because there will be a review of this topic next year a review of the Kampala amendments. And we think it's important, um, particularly for the supreme crime, not to have such a truncated jurisdictional regime. Um, as mentioned, the other initiative that um, individuals are simultaneously pursuing is creating a special tribunal on the crime of aggression for the situation of Ukraine. Um, it's in negotiations. I'm still optimistic that we're going to get a tribunal. It isn't the international tribunal that I think we all had ho hoped for, um, but we may still have a tribunal through the Council of Europe. Um, sometimes we have situations and they just seem to be beyond the reach of any of the levels I've just discussed. And I will call out China's crimes against the Uyghurs believed to constitute genocide. Um, China is a party to the Genocide Convention, but it's exercised an opt out. Um, so cannot be brought to the ICJ um, because there will be no referral and there will be no standalone tribunal. None of this would go through the Security Council due to China's veto power. Um, so um, you, 
And, um, you know, you might, um, it's hard to envision universal jurisdiction having much impact. And we also ha do have the problem, a topic for another day is immunities of high level officials. Um, sometimes in domestic courts can be a limitation to universal and other forms of jurisdiction cases. Um, we do have sometimes investigative mechanisms that can at least compile the evidence while we're searching for um, a, a fora uh, where the cases can be brought um, or universal jurisdiction. We have the triple IM in um, investigating crimes in Syria sits in Geneva, that stands for international impartial and independent mechanism. So it's compiling crime evidence. We have a similar one, the double I, double M um, compiling evidence of crimes in Myanmar stands for the independent investigative mechanism for Myanmar. Um, but again, it depends on individuals traveling um, and whether uh, the cases can be brought. So for now, they're, they're compiling evidence and preserving it, which is important. Um, Another difficulty we've seen, and I, I mentioned the veto power, and sometimes we don't have referrals. And that's why, for instance, we won't have a referral of the situation internal to Myanmar, because who would face the veto? Um, you know, the serious situation was blocked by the veto. Um, we won't have a, um, situ a referral of the crimes internal to China. I've written a book, Rebecca kindly introduced legal limits to the veto power in the face of atrocity crimes. And I argue um, if members of the council are, are blocking measures designed to prevent genocide, that's actually maybe enabling genocide. And that's another question I think we need to take to the International Court of Justice. And I'm very much in favor of the work of Citizens for Global Solutions trying to get more jurisdiction for the International Court of Justice, because it's always jurisdiction, jurisdiction, jurisdiction. We need to be able to prosecute the crimes. We need to be able to take these court cases to the court. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge sometimes there are just so many crimes that even if you have multiple levels, you're just not, you will never get, be able to prosecute all the crimes. You will never put your victims in the ex ante position, which is why we need to try to deter the crimes, something we're obviously not sufficiently doing. Yugoslavia, they had multiple levels of, of um, prosecutions, and yet there's a huge backlog of cases. We have the risk in Ukraine. The authorities in Ukraine have, you know, plunged forward, opening a huge number of investigations. It will be a huge challenge and important to fund and support these efforts. So unfortunately, justice is inevitably complete. But in conclusion, I'm encouraged um, by the um, new activity at the ICJ. Um, we have these different avenues. Um, and unfortunately, there's just so much work still to be done. Um, all those students or NGOs attending, please work in this area. And I know it sounds technical, but I think it comes down to jurisdiction, more jurisdiction for the ICC over the crime of aggression. We need more jurisdiction at the ICJ. We need more jurisdiction over um, atrocity crimes in situations we haven't yet figured out a way to reach. Um, so we have to always be clever in at least compiling evidence until we can get to a, a better place um, and, and preserve it. So I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that incredibly comprehensive um, uh, overview of what is um, I think at times an opaque tapestry of um, international law with all the different courts and tribunals that you have rendered, I think, um, very um, easily digestible, or at least a, as digestible as it can be. I know that you have to um, depart for the very good reason that you are doing this good work at the United Nations right now, and perhaps um, Her Excellency also needs to depart um, a little bit before the end of the session. Um, I see there are already some questions for you in the chat. Um, we can try our best to field them. Those, and also we can forward um, questions to you um, at a later date. And I'd Thank also you. just commend, I, yeah. I think Rebecca could probably take, I'm sorry, I can't stay to answer questions. I, have, I believe that Rebecca could answer every question that you would have for me. I think Rebecca will know how to answer. So with that, I have to sign off and leave you in her exceptional hands. Thank you so much, Jennifer, you're too kind.
Um, and I see a number of individuals in the um, in the participant room um, who I know are also engaged and uh, extremely interested in matters of United Nations reform, where Jennifer mentioned her book um, and um, pathbreaking work on the legal limits to the veto. I think that can be a session for a future day, and I look forward to continuing that discussion with many of you. Um, Jennifer um, and Her Excellency both mentioned two cases, um, two situations in which there are multiple pathways to justice, but still accountability remains elusive, um, Ukraine and Myanmar. And we are very fortunate to have with us today uh, two representatives of civil society who are going to speak directly to those situations um, from the ground in our first case. Um, it's a privilege to welcome Ari Mora, um, who is the Advocacy and Communications Manager at the Ukrainian Legal Advisory Group, who's coming to us from Kyiv. Uh, the Ukrainian Legal Advisory Group is a team of analysts and lawyers that have been monitoring the national and international political and legal landscape and analyzing how these landscapes affect the state of play in Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis other states. Um, I was privileged to meet Ari and uh, his colleagues through our joint work at the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, uh, where the court is seized of the situation in Ukraine for alleged atrocity crimes uh, committed since 2013. Um, I know that Ulag also has done immense work and advocacy um, towards ratification of the Rome Statute. As Ari may explain, um, Ukraine exceptionally has not ratified the Rome Statute, although it has accepted jurisdiction of the court in the situation um, I just mentioned, um, as well as, of course, the cases that we discussed before the ICJ, and as well as the um, uh, potential aggression tribunal and cases of universal jurisdiction. Ari, I am so pleased that you are able to join us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I hope you can still hear me well enough. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, and apologies in advance in case uh, I will, uh, in case I drop out, I should not, but uh, that might happen due to some uh, power uh, offs that we are currently having. Um, anyways, so so uh, let's not waste this uh, precious time, I'd say. Um, hi, my name is uh, Arya, and um, I, I'll probably start with the a bit of an, a brief explanation in terms of uh, some of the insights that we that we have uh, uh, as to what has been the uh, justice international justice response uh, uh, for Ukraine so far and uh, why uh, we are in this place uh, as a Ukrainian legal advisory group to kind of observe and try to make some impact in it. Uh, to be very briefly, I, our primary um, uh, work is basically twofold is uh, a strategic litigation which is we represent victims and survivors of grave international crimes in uh, domestic and international forests and mechanisms uh, and um, uh, we also uh, do a lot of work uh, in terms of strengthening the capacity and potential both of the domestic system but also of the justice architecture for ukraine uh, in general, and uh, we do that through various uh, means, I'd say, uh, including the strategic litigation efforts uh, through which we also am able to identify various issues that uh, are there in the system and that needs to be addressed, uh, but also through analysis, uh, through engagement with the uh, representatives of domestic national uh, of domestic justice system, of inter with international partners and experts, et cetera, et cetera. So the reason I'm saying this is because we have been privileged to be involved in quite a lot of uh, initiatives and processes taking place uh, related to conflict-related justice uh, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, that gave us a bit of a, a perspective as to what are, what are like where we are at right now, especially because most of the core team of our organization uh, have been working here since uh, 2014, 2015. So we've, we've managed to kind of observe how it's evolving and uh, uh, try to impact it uh, as much as we can to, um, to basically uh, from the from the point uh, when where it all uh, started in a way, and uh, right now it uh, looks 
the following. So before the full scale invasion, the war has been ongoing for uh, uh, eight years, right? So it's uh, since 2014. Uh, and they didn't have much of uh, international justice response, unfortunately, although both the ICC and the ICJ has been involved into this process. For, so as already mentioned with the ICJ case uh, that has already, uh, where the decision is already uh, uh, rendered, as well as the uh, jurisdiction uh, by the, of the ICC was accepted by Ukraine uh, to investigate uh, and uh, uh, look into the situation uh, back in 2015. And it, it, it works for, uh, for, for the period of time since the beginning of the armed conflict. Uh, but uh, with the ICC, it was the preliminary examination up until 2019, when uh, the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court said, well, there is a reasonable ground to uh, say that there is a, uh, so there is a ground for opening an investigation, but uh, right now we cannot do that due to the shortage of limit of resources and therefore the need to prioritize cases. Uh, and uh, everything kind of, uh, uh, turn 360 or not 360, 180, right? Uh, uh, in after the full scale invasion, not for a good reason, but rather because uh, the full scale invasion happened, and that led to a very significant international justice response. Uh, which, uh, to be quite honest, we are very much cognizant of the fact that it is uh, an unprecedented response. We know and we work on uh, promoting the idea that it, this should be the kind of response, at least in terms of its scope and the uh, amount of efforts and money put into this is the approach that should be taken in any uh, conflict situation. Uh, however, the issue is that we need to also make sure that all of these resources uh, are that are put are utilized efficiently and effectively and that they, they actually result in meaningful justice. And uh, right now we do have a plethora of uh, elements of this justice architecture. So the domestic system, which bears the main responsibility for prosecuting, investigating atrocity crimes, the ICC, which is taking this uh, particular set of cases uh, that are the gravest and that they are uh, that are concerning the uh, uh, top uh, leadership uh, and stuff like that. Uh, we do have several initiatives on the, the level of universal jurisdiction. So when the country, uh, when the third country that does not have a direct relation relationship to the crime that occurred, uh, can pick the pick up the case uh, uh, without the standard links that the state should have in order to have jurisdiction over something over some case. So, for example, uh, uh, Germany investigating the case uh, of. Uh, uh, of uh, of a survivor uh, that has been uh, uh, the survivor of uh, conflict related sexual violence uh, committed in Ukraine, a Ukrainian citizen, and this sexual violence was committed by Russian soldiers. So that's the and this case is potentially something that that for example Germany can pick up. Uh, I I just saw that there was a question on UJ, so I wanted to make sure that we are on the same page at, on this uh, general level. Uh, we do have some uh, oh, joint investigative teams. Uh, we do have, of course, the ICJ that has been already touched upon and some other things that I will not be going deep into. But uh, the question is that, unfortunately, despite the fact that there is so much going on, it is still not necessarily the case that the the justice architecture for Ukraine is comprehensive and self-sufficient and does not need any further improvement, development, or strengthening. And uh, the reason for this is uh, uh, like multifold, right? So there are some uh, integral limitations, such as, for example, with the International Criminal Court, uh, the mandate is quite specific and limited, and it's fine. We all understand that the, this is a court of last resort, and uh, uh, that's when uh, it steps in. Uh, with the domestic justice system, it has a lot of challenges in domestically, internally, with the legal framework, with the uh, capacity and expertise of the uh, of uh, uh, professionals, uh, ju judges, investigators, and stuff like that. Uh, but 
so some of these challenges are integral and should be just recognized. Uh, others need to be addressed. And uh, that's one part where we need to actively work on. And in that sense, for example, we, uh, while, while being cognizant of the limitations of the International Criminal Court, we also push for it to be strengthened as much as possible so that it can utilize and exercise its mandate if as efficiently as possible. And that comes in terms both in terms of the resources, in terms of the um, so lack of resources, lack of uh, uh, trust by, uh, by some states and direct threats to the court, which undermine its work, not only for the situations to, with relation to which these threats are I think we might have temporary, temporarily lost Ari. He did warn us that this could happen with a blackout in Kiev. Hopefully he is able to rejoin us shortly. Um, as we wait for him to do so, I will just address um, a couple of the questions, or uh, one question in particular in the chat about why Ukraine does not ratify the Rome Statute. Um, and here, as with many states uh, that have not ratified the Rome stat Statute, the primary issue is domestic. Um, I worked for a, a while with an organization called Parliamentarians for Global Action that worked with members of the uh, the legislature, the Vokov Narada, towards ratification. But in Ukraine, it would take a constitutional amendment, which is quite difficult to achieve. So Ari, while we waited for you to rejoin us, I just took one question from the chat on your behalf regarding ratification. Um, please continue at your at your leisure. Uh, yeah, I understand that I also, I'm sorry for dropping uh, out, but uh, I also understand that uh, I don't have too much time left, so I'll be brief and then we'll be happy to elaborate whenever uh, possible and uh, needed. So just to be very clear, uh, uh, I guess the point that I want to make is that um, we need to look at the at what are the uh, lacking parts and uh, lacking elements to the justice architecture for a particular situation. It is important specifically for the reason that uh, if we want to aim towards a comprehensive system, we need to look at this kind of gaps that uh, we see in the first place. And so with Ukraine, uh, this is a good example of the situation where a lot of effort is poured into the situation, but not always the assessment of these needs and issues that needs to be that need to be addressed comes at the right place at the right moment and uh, at the right at the right time. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, because of that, uh, there has been some dragging uh, in terms of the, all of these initiatives to actually start being uh, as efficient as possible. And uh, that's why we've been quite heavily promoting something that one can call like a needs-based approach, right? So that we actually look into the needs of the system and then look for the solutions to address those needs. Uh, that's why we've just launched uh, the, the report on needs assessment of Ukraine domestic justice system and uh, internationally as well. But the point is that it does, if something isn't working necessarily the best way possible, it doesn't necessarily mean that something shouldn't exist. Rather, we just need to look at, uh, into what needs to be strengthened. And uh, for Ukraine, for example, while uh, the, the case, case in point is uh, the uh, idea for the international, for the tribunal for the crime of aggression, uh, which has come as an idea first as with a glaring gap, because there's, of course, at, at this point, no uh, jurisdiction. Uh, we believe that this jurisdiction should be um, uh, eventually with the ICC, and we all need to work on that. But also we understand that the gap is not only with the crime of aggression, but with all other atrocity crimes, which are now not, the, which is not possible to effectively prosecute and investigate in the stand in the state of the justice architecture where it is right now, and that's why, for example, we've been uh, advocating uh, to consider at least the special court or a special mechanism, but one that would be able to uh, cover all grave crimes, not just crime of aggression. So the point here is uh, literally that we need to look into the, those needs and and uh, see how all of these mechanisms can coexist, which they can, and practice shows that various international mechanisms, as well as domestic ones, can coexist. You just need to make sure they are cooperating in, in the right way and are actually complementary to each other. I'll stop here. Thank you. 
Byakuyo, um, Ari, and you touched on two themes that I hope we can return to in discussion and that I think also dovetail with a question that I've seen in the Q&A about how like-minded organizations are working together, which is the important role that civil society can pay, play, not only in supporting the universality of these institutions, but also their effectiveness, as you illustrated with the International Criminal Court example. Um, I will hand it to uh, my co-moderator, Alan, to introduce our next speaker. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. And just before I introduce the next speaker, I want to give a special thank you uh, to Ari for joining us under really difficult circumstances. You know, we know, you know, what's happening with Ukraine, with these military attacks from Russia, and the very fact that the power is one of the, the systems, civilian system that's being attacked by Russia is, is again, one of the, the, what we'd say is the litany of likely war crimes that have been undertaken there. This is very, very real. You're, you're suffering from this and, and you, you come and join us to be able to talk about the ways that you're trying to take this forward on a legal approach. We have a lot of respect and thank you so much for, for joining us. And this reflects that these are very real issues that we're dealing with these. These are real atrocities that are happening um, and that these legal systems are a really important part of trying to prevent these or respond and bring about accountability for, uh, for what's happening. So thank you so much for joining. A very similar situation we have also, you know, we're swinging over to, to a, the situation of Rohingya now who have been suffering uh, severely, you know, under the, the regime uh, in Myanmar. Um, we're very, very um, honoured to have Dr. Mohammed Habib Ullah uh, with us today to give you know some direct experience from there. Uh, he's born into the ethnicity of Rohingya. Uh, he has uh, got his PhD at the University Kabang Sun in Malaysia. He's uh, authored and co-authored more than 60 international and journal articles, presented research work in many international conferences. Um, and he serves uh, in a number of roles, including on the Provisional Convening Council member of the Congress of Nations and States, which is a very interesting entity, which you may want to mention a little bit in your presentation, bringing together rights of peoples and states together. Again, there's a, a cross-referencing here uh, to the rights which we're also uh, talking about and protecting uh, through the, the tribunals. Uh, and he's also a member of the Arakan Rohingya National Alliance and General Secretary of the Arakan Rohingya National Organization. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Habib Ola, and the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you for having me in today's very excellent event. And uh, <clears throat> I'm little bit, uh, uh, the, my background is not legal or any legal um, expertise I don't have. Uh, so it will be a little bit uh, uh, out of the uh, uh, trend as today's talk. I'll be sharing some uh, ground experience uh, where uh, my people on the ground, how is suffering and uh, post-genocide, uh, after 2017 genocides, what is still going on and how we are being failed by uh, by uh, different institutions. And um, uh, uh, I am the member of Convening Council of, as he mentions, Congress of Nation and States, uh, where we partner with people, nation and states around the world to deliver unique contribution and solution. <clears throat> we work together in different uh, part, different corner of the world. Uh, what uh, brings the rights for the people. And also, I'm a general secretary of Arkan Rohingya National Organization, which is a broad-based political organization uh, comprised of uh, 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 political leaders, uh, activists, and, and uh, the community leaders. So I'll be directly going to the, 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 uh, the atrocities that um, uh, happen against my people. So how we failed to address um, uh, in the preventive measures to today. As we mentioned uh, earlier, the genocide, uh, oh, everybody, we are looking at the genocide, what happened in 2017, but uh, it has been started since uh, independence of, of Burma, uh, which is 1947, 48, gradually uh, after military takeover, and the first exodus uh, happened uh, in 1978, where Operation Dragon King and first uh, hundreds of thousands of Rohingya people displaced from their home and uh, flee to Bangladesh. 
So uh, one after another, uh, it's been a couple of times uh, the refugee crisis happened and from, uh, towards Bangladesh. Today, 80% of the total Rohingya population is, is uh, out of their home, majority in Bangladesh and some neighboring countries. So we have been trying to uh, uh, warn international community that's today, where we are today. But uh, we are being failed to address that preventive uh, measures can be taken. <laughs> if we see specifically after 1982 citizenship law, this is a very obvious sign of genocide that is being started. But uh, still we are being ignored since then. So in 2017, the final stage of genocide, what we have seen, more than a million of Rohingya people has been displaced. And um, as a last resort, we seek for justice in the International uh, Court of Justice and International Criminal Court and so on. But the complicacy still remains non-state party, uh, as, as some other speakers mentioned, the jurisdiction issues. And uh, finally, I'm, we are really thankful to Gambia brought that case to the International Court of Justice and we have provisional measures in 2019. But interestingly, from 2019 and today, even though there were the provisional measures being ordered and uh, uh, for the to to protect this uh, um, Rohingya community, Rohingya people who were in left some, we would say about estimated 600,000 Rohingya people were there in that time. Uh, IDPs and some in a couple of two three townships. But today they are they are being uh, forced out of their town, whatever even left remain. So what we see here, uh, the the atrocities never stopped. It's getting worse and worse. But the perpetrator parties are uh, become more parties. Before it was military and and uh, extreme Buddhist. Now military and the ethnic armed group, what we call Arkan Army. So uh, Rohingyas are become a sandwiched by both this both military and Arkan army. So that the last two township, um, some Rohingya families were there. So today they have been rooted out from that too. The uh, Butchidong township is completely cleaned out. All the, the Rohingya villagers who were uh, lived in Butchidong township, they have been forced out and Couple of hundreds are still in Mongrel, so they are in process. They are fighting to take over. Arkan army are fighting to take over. So we are we, we may see the la, the left couple of hundred families will be out of their home also. So there will be basically no place at all in that whole uh, the northern Rakhine state where we once called our homeland. Although there are some steps being taken by inter, uh, international community, U, United Nations and, and ICJ and uh, the, the going on uh, in the universal jurisdiction in Argentina court. But the bottom line is, is the atrocity against uh, my community never stopped. So what 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 do we believe? All the justice system, international community, international uh, legal system is to save people and prosecute who who are uh, pros uh, perpetrated those uh, crimes and atrocities. But uh, what we are seeing is it it never stopped. So I think it is it is high time to to uh, look at the look at the these atrocities. In the, in the very close eye and see if uh, um, we can do some some other avenue like ind independent tribunal or truth commission, whatsoever language we use, we whatever remaining Rohingyas to save their life, we really need to look at the off the book or, or some, or however especially uh, possible to save the life whoever there and bring them to justice. And at the same time, uh, we have seen a couple of uh, other incidents happening, Ukraine, Russia, uh, Palestine, Israel, 
and uh, that incidents happening uh, all over the world. So uh, whenever something new happens, automatically whatever uh, still remains, these are uh, the list of the priorities. So I would like to request all of you, uh, through all of you, all the international community, uh, to 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 uh, bring not only stop the genocide, but uh, to bring those are uh, responsible to bring it bring it to the accountable and bring to the justice. Thank you very much. I am open for a question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ula, for that incredibly personal and profound perspective. Um, we do see some questions already coming through in the chat, um, including about the Summit of the Future process, including um, proposals for new courts and tribunals um, and complementarity. I encourage you now, as we move to our last speaker, to not be shy about using the Q&A and the chat function, and we hope to have a rich discussion. Um, but for now, for our final speaker, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and the co-convener of the Impact Coalition on Just Institutions and one of the co-founders of the Legal Alternatives to War campaign, Neshan Gunasekara. Um, Neshan, uh, your organizations um, are co-founders and co-sponsors, so I want to give a, a big shout out to the World Future Council and the, right, uh, and the Raoul Wallenberg Institute. Um, and also, I will just briefly share some of your bio, um, that you're an international lawyer, educationalist, leadership coach, facilitator, and environmentalist from Sri Lanka. Um, you're also the legacy holder for the late Right Livelihood Laureate, Judge C.G. Wiramantri, and co-chair of the Earth Trusteeship Working Group of the Right Livelihood College. Um, and we are hoping that you can bring us a little bit of the perspective of having worked for one of the greatest jurists ever, um, and I'm not biased, I don't think, um, to grace the ICJ and one of the most prolific uh, and profound legal scholars um, of his or our time, Judge Wiramantri. And so with our final reflections before we move into the discussion por portion of our program, over to you, Neshan. Thank you, Rebecca, for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'll be begin with Your Excellency who's connecting us from The Hague and I'll immediately Judge Veeramantri connects to The Hague. So Judge Christopher Veeramantri, who as Rebecca said, uh, uh, is one of the most outstanding jurists of the last uh, century to say the least. He was uh, Vice President of the International Court of Justice over a quarter of a century ago between the years 1997 and 1999 and served the International Court of Justice for one tenure between 1990 and 1999. And much of what uh, Ambassador Buller, Professor Trahan, and what was shared by, with a lot of respect for Ari and Dr. Ula, looks at this key area that Judge Veeramantri pioneered during his tenure at the International Court of Justice, uh, which is looking at the evolution of the 20th century modus operandi of international law into a 21st century modus operandi. Now, uh, Professor Trahan talked about the strengths and weaknesses of the international adjudication system vis-a-vis -vis the International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court. And more and more atrocity crimes and individuals are being held responsible, but we haven't still fully realized this in the international criminal architecture as of yet. And a couple of examples uh, that I could showcase uh, during uh, his tenure at the International Court of Justice, Judge Veeramantri contributed to what I call transforming a kind of a Eurocentric mode of international law, which was built around the Westphalian peace of 1648, the Hugo Grotius period of modernizing international law, which kept it within very much Eurocentric age, within the state centricism of the last century, uh, which was kind of built around the empire system going back 100 years to the 21st century mode where international law is infused with the wisdom of the philosophies and the cultures and religious practices across the world. Judge Veeramantri during his time at the International Court of Justice brought the wisdom of Islamic faith, Hindu faith, Confucianism, 
and different elements of Christianity, Judaism, and brought it as customary principles of international law and made it part of international jurisprudence. And his singular contribution being one of the pioneers of international environmental law, bringing indigenous knowledge systems into the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice. Now, I'll pick a couple of uh, uh, examples uh, of, of his decisions uh, in 1993, there was a case between Denmark, Denmark and Norway with regard to the delimitation, delimitation of the sea. And again, uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Buller mentioned big countries, small countries, but in front of the UN Charter, they're all one. But in contesting uh, principles of the law of the sea, Judge Viramantri went into world wisdom to discuss equity before international uh, law. And dived deep into these different systems which is available. To get a bit technical on this, in fact, the International Court of Justice Statute uh, Article 9 specifies that whoever uh, was selected as judges, and Ambassador Bula referred to this, are not merely competent of international law. These are not requirement that they be international law experts alone from their respective jurisdictions. But when they appointed the International Court of Justice, they have a higher calling on duty, a sacred duty, not to merely represent the country that they may come from or the legal system that they represent, but represent all civilizations and principal legal systems on our earth. And this is one of the key uh, provisions of the statute that Judge Viramantri utilized very well in his decisions. Now, I mentioned that this case uh, of equity on international law and want to connect this uh, to an incredibly inspiring uh, story is coming from Pacific Island states. And as some of you are involved and know already, a group of young leaders from Solomon Islands and other Pacific Islands moved the whole United Nations last March to get a consensus resolution from the highest institution, which is the General Assembly. Almost 132 plus countries signed on to this to put the question of climate change to the International Court of Justice. Now, I want to take this example and also now talk a little bit about the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, which on the 22nd of May this year, delivered an advisory opinion on climate change vis-a-vis -vis the law of the sea. Now, law of the sea does not function in isolation of the principles of public international law. Now, of course, it seems absurd to a lay person to see that the seas are not part of our earth, right? But for, for this to function well, there has to be a conversation between these young people who champion this case of bringing climate change to the highest court in the United Nations, which sits at The Hague, and this tribunal of the law of the sea advice the opinion which also had 22 judges have a consensus decision with regard to state obligations, with regard to law of the sea and uh, the climate change. Now, when the ICJ begins its proceedings, possibly in early 2025 at The Hague, the decisions from the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea becomes a key part of that discourse as well. And 132 member states have signed on. And initially we had... Uh, Rebecca mentioned that only 74 countries have signed on to the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Now, we should not take this in isolation to the fascinating and inspiring work that the Swiss government is taking to bring other countries to sign on to this compulsory jurisdiction without understanding consensus resolutions of the General Assembly, other agreements that countries have signed up to. And in fact, under international law, one of the core principles of uh, of good faith uh, is something called pacta sunt for sarvanda, which is promises you are making are meant to be kept. And that is a Latin maxim that Judge Viramantri utilized uh, to the maximum. And one of the key components that the judges will be required to going into is the precedence of these courts. And in 1997, Judge Veera Mantri, amongst the 20 plus separate opinions and dissenting opinions he wrote, wrote a treatise on sustainable development law, which brought the concept of sustainable development, made it into principles of international law, to almost 20 years ahead of the United Nations systems adopting the sustainable development goals. And this is something that the International Law Commission Association picked up in 2002 in the New Delhi Principles of Sustainable Development. And he has been attributed to bringing 
conceptual framework, connecting the customary principles and bringing it to the international legal world in that concrete way. So I think it's Judge Viramantri is not a single person who just sat at the International Court of Justice, but to understand that he sat at a time that was a transition going on in the international landscapes, 1990s, as most of you will recall, was a challenging time for the international law world. There were number of atrocities being committed, but it was also subsequently uh, to the episodes of 1989, where the Cold War had come to an end, and then there's suddenly a resurgence of an understanding and appreciation of international cooperation and solidarity. And in 1996, when the International Court of Justice was celebrating 50 years, the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea was created. Two years later, the Rome Statute came into being, and four years later, in 2002, the International Criminal Court, which Rebecca and Professor Trahan mentioned in great detail, came into being. But now we are in a phase of post-globalization and how international law works. And that needs to be respected across all cultures. And this is where the wisdom of all world religions, philosophies, and practices need to infuse the future phase of international law. And this is the foremost connection between the judiciary is what we call it at the international level, the tribunal of the law of the sea, the judicial architecture of the United Nations with the ICJ at The Hague uh, and the tribunal of the sea, which sits in Hamburg, but also its relationship with the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the African Court of Human Rights and People's uh, Rights, as well as other institutions at the national level. I mean, just to take the climate change example, we have almost 2,600 cases going on at the national level. All these had added momentum when international jurisprudence part, kind of impart their wisdom into this. And when the young people who are inspired to bring this change is fighting across the planet to bring states as well as uh, the private sector accountable on these issues. They look to the wisdom of our elders. And here Judge Veera Mantri has really led the way, especially pioneering principles of trusteeship and intergenerational equity. And finally, I want to leave with this note. I think 125 years ago that we had the first peace uh, conference at The Hague, which established uh, the Permanent Court of International Arbitration, which paved the way to the League of Nations at the time of the empires to create what is called the Permanent Court of International Justice. Later, it became uh, the, fa with the failure of the League of Nations during that period, the United Nations and now the International Court of Justice. We are in this interesting time that our own lived experience are going to shape the next phase of international law. But we owe a sacred obligation to all those people who sacrificed their young lives to bring us this world, to create these institutions in this 125 years. 125 years ago, national jurisdictions or what was going at the domestic level infused the work of international systems. But today, young people across the world are citing Judge Veera Mantri and other fantastic opinions of the International Court of Justice in national jurisdictions. The flow is the other way around. And I want to leave it in that optimistic note but without forgetting that we have challenges ahead of us. But I remember that Judge Veera Mantri is saying that we have a sacred duty to infuse international law with our lived experiences, but also with cultures and traditions and indigenous knowledge systems and the best available sciences. I'm looking forward to the discussion and supporting this journey. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Nashan. Um, as ever, you. You never fail to inspire, and I think that's a perfect way to, to kick off the more participatory portion of our program. Um, as we do so, I'll commend to your attention um, our friends from uh, the UN Association of the UK have pointed out that the ICJ proceedings are broadcast on UN TV, including tomorrow, a very important one, um, a decision uh, on, uh, in respect to the advisory opinion request on the legal consequences of Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories. Um, so please, you can always tune in. This is a wonderful example of judicial transparency in action. And I'll hand it over to Alan to begin our question and answer portion. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I'm actually going to uh, group our three questions together and then ask um, all of the panelists to ask either part or all of those because they're very much related. Um, well, the first one is on the UN Summit of the Future, which will take place at the end of September. Uh, and 
what do you think would be important decisions um, or uh, key calls uh, to be elevated by or adopted at the summit of the future regarding international justice? And I'm going to group a couple that sort of come a, a, a pointed along those lines. Uh, because so far there is a People's Pact for the Future, uh, and the Rev2 just came out, I think, a couple of days ago, and it includes a little bit about the International Court of Justice and international, uh, international justice and international law, but not as much as what civil society has been pushing for. So a comparison between what the governments are currently considering uh, and what we would like them to consider and to take forward, I think is part of answering this question, that also points to the question that Patricia Rogers has asked about universal just jurisdiction, because part of what in the civil society and the People's Pact for the Future is calling for universal jurisdiction, acceptance of universal jurisdiction for the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. So what, what do we mean by that? And, and why is civil society calling for that? And finally, this is also linked to this because in the People's Pact for the Future, there's also a, a, an encouragement of additional tribunals to be established, including an international court for the environment, and an international anti-corruption court. And there was a question about what might the international court for the environment cover? Would it include both corporate um, actors and states parties? And would it be broader than ecocide? So it's quite a few things that are grouped together there. Um, and I'll go first to Rebecca, uh, because Rebecca has been, in a sense, uh, following some of this very closely. And then I'll go to the other panellists to answer either a part or the whole of those three grouped questions. Rebecca. Uh, thank you so much, Alan. Um, so just to clarify, um, one of the three um, main outcome documents of the Summit of the Future is anticipated to be this pact for the future. Um, the other two being a declaration for future generations and a global digital compact, which of course are intersectional and interrelation, uh, interrelated. Um, and what Alan just referred to, the People's Pact, is an advocacy tool um, that has been uh, championed and led by our friends at the Coalition for the UN Night and Nations We Need, C4UN, um, and where um, Alan Neshan and I have all played a role, um, a small role in contributing to some of the recommendations that we would hope to see in a pact for the future, or even if not at the pact for the future, the summit of the future, that states can take on long thereafter, because this process will not end um, in September. International justice, as Neshan pointed out, is evolutionary. Um, and we look forward to this being a continuous process of, of growth and maturation. Um, and I think that also speaks a little bit to one of the questions or points about um, like-minded actors coming together. And in addition to the proposals that Alan mentioned, uh, there is also a World Court of Human Rights proposal. Um, and in the peace and security chapter, there is, I think, more that can be done um, in terms of uh, treaty obligations, um, as well as the universality. The, and we can put in the chat right now, the Rev 2, the second draft, so actually the third draft after a zero draft of the Pact for the Future, um, and it calls for compliance with ICJ decisions, but not universality. Um, and of course, it does not mention the ICC or any other bodies. So this is where we see some of the lacunae and civil society has an opportunity to step up. Um, there are civil society days on the margins um, or before the, the, the summit of the future itself. Um, and our organizations are banding together and we welcome you to join us um, to try to make some of these proposals that might have hit the cutting room floor of the Pact for the Future and might not make the might not see the light of day at the summit itself. Um, so thank you for allowing me um, the, the largest to speak a little bit to the civil society side. Um, and I would love to hear um, Ambassador if you had some reactions from the state side um, and from our colleagues as well. Nashan Ari, and um, of course, Dr. Ula, um, Ambassador. Thank you. Um, perhaps just a short answer, uh, also with regard to the question of additional uh, tribunal. I think it's, you always have to find a, a fine balance because between fragmentation and more uh, chaos in understanding uh, uh, who is competent for what, and uh, additional uh, uh, tribunal, it's a, it's a thin line. So I think um, uh, coming up with a lot of new uh, um, uh, tribunal 
would be perhaps the uh, uh, not a, such a, a, an efficient uh, idea. Uh, we uh, and uh, I think we should uh, rather try to focus also on the existing uh, tribunal that we have and enforcing them uh, their their competences uh, might also be a. a, a uh, perhaps less sexy than if you come with something brand new, but might be uh, even uh, even more um, more efficient. Would anyone else like to come in on that question or those that set of questions? There was a lot to unpack there. Ari. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for the questions, and uh, uh, I mean. Two things. So first, on special on special courts for new tribunals, uh, I completely echo the idea that um, we might we we need to be uh, mindful when considering new institutions to be established. Uh, this is always a very costly, very hard process, uh, especially in order to make it. Uh, a new mechanism that would be actually recognized and respected by the international community. Otherwise, there is a risk that we just create something that will not have a real impact that everyone puts so many hopes uh, for. And for that, uh, and that's something that has been a, quite a, a, tra a trend, at least when it comes to uh, international criminal law, uh, the idea of uh, special courts, hybrid courts, for example, has been more and more... Uh, kind of potent, uh, especially since the beginning of the uh, of the 21st century, but also it started with international courts such as ICTY and the uh, uh, Tribunal for Rwanda. Uh, the point is that all of those solutions, they, uh, they occur after the consideration of what are we missing and what is necessary to fill the gaps that are there in the first place. Uh, those uh, it, only when we see that there's something that needs to be created specifically to fill some of the gaps that other institutions cannot fill, this will be the proper complementing structure and it will, it will uh, rather be efficient than competing or anything else. And for Ukraine, for example, as I've mentioned before, we believe that this is exactly that point, uh, which is uh, we, uh, in terms of crime of aggression, we need to really continue on making the existing structure for the crime, of, for particularly when it comes to the crime of aggression, the ICC to be actually capable of prosecuting this crime with the other atrocity crimes. Uh, this is the point where the ICC has its part of the whole thing. And then there is more that can be complemented, uh, can be managed by the complementing institution. And CAR uh, Special Court, the Central African Republic Special Court, is an example of the institution that can coexist with the ICC and do not compete, but rather work together to fill uh, all the accountability gaps as much as possible. And lastly, on civil society um, uh, role, and I feel like that's a huge, uh, huge thing because often civil society organizations are at the for forefront of uh, justice initiatives uh, in many situations. Uh, often they are being undermined and dismissed as uh, not as ex expert based or not as experienced. This is often also not true. And uh, so I'd say um, with the ICC, for example, one of the very important parts of the court still, you know, uh, court uh, interest being promoted and advocated for is the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, which unites a lot of institutions and the representatives from all over the world. Uh, the issue is, however, whether the civil society has its place on the at the table. Because often, unfortunately, as also was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, there is some sort of involvement and engagement with CSOs, but it's cut short when it comes to actual decision-making level conversations. And it's understandable that, of course, there are some things that needs to be decided solely by states or with a limited access. But also, this is the point where we often find that uh, civil society is cut much earlier than uh, it could have been, uh, to make the conversation more robust, more uh, holistic and comprehensive. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And I know that Ambassador Sis Rambula needs to leave for a next meeting. Did you have any parting words before you want to leave? And thank you so much for your uh, contributions today. Thank you and uh, you. good luck for the rest of the discussion. And I'm sure it's not the last time we have such a, an interesting discussion on, uh, on this topic. Thank you. Bye bye. Merci. And thank, thank you, you Switzerland, much. for your leadership in this regard. And just before we move on from the summit of the future, I would like to give Neshan the floor because, Neshan, you've been very engaged um, in. Uh, civil society engagement in the summit of the future on important issues of international law. We've talked a little bit about the People's Pact for the Future is also calling for the acceptance of uh, or, uh, uh, movement on jurisdiction of both the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court, but you've also been working on elevating the rights of future generations. Uh, would you like to say a little bit about that before we move on to the next questions? Uh, thank you, Anna. I'm just wondering, Dr. Ulla also unmuted himself. I was wondering whether he wanted to say something. No, he didn't. Thank, thank you very much. Goodness. Okay, Alan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, points being highlighted in the chat, including uh, the findings in the People's Pact, which I think is an interesting document, which further elaborates the importance of the International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, and other tribunals and, and jurisdiction, which was one of the key things that Professor Trahan expanded upon. Um, two quick points uh, to what Rebecca mentioned about the outcome, uh, the Declaration on Future Generations and the Digital Compact. It's a transition time uh, of the the global multilateral system. I mean, the summit of the future is a unique opportunity, I think, to try to factor in things, looking at the medium to long term, beyond the nine to 10 year term, but 25 years, 50 years down the line, which seems utopian sometime, but rights of future generations, unfortunately is not in the wording of the river two, which was just shared on the path for the future. In fact, the, Paragraph 41 in the previous revision, the revision one, in fact, referred to rights of uh, future generations, but now it is removed for whatever reason. But this is exactly where the civil society needs to really pick up the baton and say, look, they cannot go longer uh, because back, you know, 25 years ago, one quick example, again, from Judge Vera Mantri in his kind of dissenting opinion on the legality threat of use of nuclear weapons clearly illustrated the importance of international law vis-a-vis -vis rights of future generations and taking mechanisms. And this is uh, what uh, needs to be built into the multilateral system in a very cohesive way. And the World Future Council has been pushing uh, for the very first recommendation, which is uh, creating an envoy on future generations, which has been included as the first recommendation on the Declaration on Future Generations. But it's not a given. The question of how this is going to be financed, and, and the ambassador was talking about, you know, where does the finances come from these, uh, you know, strengthening institutions? And how does this institution then work with uh, the international judicial architecture? And those questions need to be raised, especially when uh, issues such as climate change is being taken. And finally, uh, it's two months uh, to uh, the summit of the future starting today. And I think there's a lot of effort that needs to be taken uh, possibly using the people's pact for, uh, for the future, which Alan, you and Rebecca also contributed quite a, heavily on the chapter on peace and security. But from to bring the future generations thinking uh, in, in, into uh, to our decision-making processes and whoever's interested here in this discussion can also lobby your respective civil society partners and your national governments or regional governments, including the African Union, um, Inter-American, system or the European Union, because they will play a crucial part in the summit uh, and the lead up to it. So I think I will leave it at that, but the information is already shared uh, in the chat. I'm happy to take, uh, uh, you know, uh, connect with whoever is interested ahead of the summit. Thank you, Alan. Thank you so much, Nishan. We're almost at time. We might, with um, everyone's uh, kind forgiveness, go a couple minutes over, not too long. Um, but there have been a group of questions um, in the chat and in the Q&A function regarding um, the dynamics between international courts and tribunals and with regional courts and tribunals and the principle of complementarity and subsidiarity. Um, 
how, uh, I think one of the questions asked, um, how do you determine which, if any of these decisions holds when there is conflict between them? How do you resolve conflicts of laws, which of course is a whole section for those of you who've gone to law school, a whole section of law school that you can cover. Um, and how uh, is the uh, potential proliferation of the regional court system helpful or hurtful um, to the project of international justice? So I'd like to group those questions. Um, and then one for Alan, I think as well, there was a question on how do we ultimately achieve peace uh, in all its forms and end conflict, including uh, with small arms and light weapons, uh, not just the nuclear threat that we know is omnipresent, um, but um, at all stages of NIACs, non-international uh, armed conflicts, um, international armed conflicts, and those that we don't even have names for yet. Um, and uh, here I hope that you can speak a little bit to the developing jurisprudence around peace as a human right. So first for the complementarity um, and a cooperation question, um, I would go to either Ari or Neshan. I think uh, Dr. Ula has had to leave us as had the ambassador and Professor Trahan. So if either of you would like to, to take that question first, then I'll go over to Alan and then we just have some closing thoughts um, before we conclude today. Ari or Neshan? Ari, thank you. I, I can briefly comment and then uh, Neshan maybe can uh, comment as well. But uh, I mean, briefly, I, uh, from our experience, uh, this is of course uh, a, a highly, uh, uh, a, a question that is uh, uh, dependent on specific uh, circumstances of particular situation. situation. So often when, when it comes to uh, structures uh, such as international, uh, tribunals such as the ICC, for example, which are permanent structures, uh, the regional courts, not always, of course, but at least the ones that, for example, I'm referring to mostly are the ad hoc uh, uh, ad hoc uh, mechanisms. So, so they are created, established specifically for the specific situation, for a specific time frame with a specific mandate. And uh, in that sense, uh, it, is, uh, it is important to um, take into account all the individual uh, features of each of the conflict situation to make a relevant mechanism that would actually address the justice needs that are there in the, in the particular case. Uh, I'd say that uh, this is possible if uh, uh, one is doing the uh, proper analysis beforehand, and the same can be said in terms of complementarity and subsidiarity. So uh, those things can be envisaged and structured properly if uh, they are analyzed beforehand. So for example, uh, in, the, in a similar way, the universal jurisdiction principle in international criminal law uh, works in, in, the, in, the, in the way that most countries that can prosecute domestically would, de would defer the case to the ICC if they find out that the ICC can prosecute and is about to, uh, under the principle of subsidi subsidiarity, uh, in, which means that you can, like this is about uh, these different mechanisms, uh, having, um, let's call it conversa a conversation and enshrining these provisions in the uh, statute of this mechanism so that you know it's clear who is doing what and when one is stepping uh, and another one is stepping out. Um, Otherwise, I'd say this is unfortunately easier said than done. Uh, so in that in that case, uh, the only thing I, I can say that uh, ad hoc mechanisms and regional mechanisms can really be a very important uh, a very important tool and has proven to be a very efficient tool if they are created properly and are being operationalized with enough resources and enough support because they can, often better understand uh, some nuances of the region, some local context, not necessarily to take away from the international mechanisms, but rather to complement in places where needed and help to improve both uh, the situation, but also the work of the international mechanism as well. Thank you, Neshan. But, yeah. This is a separate session altogether, Rebecca. I think we need another one on complementarity and to go alongside the veto one, which we probably can bring it together. But I agree with uh, what Ari also said, but in, in, in short, there is complementarity easily at many different levels. How the institutions coexist with one another, 
not the fact that they are based at the Hague specifically to talk about the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice, uh, to note that the International Court of Justice is the only main UN organ outside of New York, and it sits at the Hague. And the fact that the decisions, the judges, the court staff, they all have a relationship. Now, the ICJ is a creature of the United Nations Charter, whereas ICC is not. It sits outside. But still, the ICC, for it to function, still needs member states to accept its jurisdiction. And you've got to see that the ICC Rome Statute, which have obviously came in 1998, is already signed by 125 states, whereas ICJ is still signed for the compulsory jurisdiction only by 74. And the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, 169. And these are also aspects that complements each other. And we will see more and more, as Professor Trohan mentioned, it's, it's a very busy time for the International Court of Justice. But when they come out with an advisory opinion or a decision on a contentious issue, these are matters that the ICC, uh, indi the, both individually, but also on the advisory opinions, also impart and have an influence in their decision making as well. I think this is something that can be unpacked quite a lot in the next 10 to 15 years when both courts are going to get incre incredibly busy in the short to medium term. And I think that's a rich opportunity for this new phase of international law to come into being. Um, as Alan mentioned at the outset, um, this is the hopefully um, the first or the first pair in a series. I think we already have some recommendations here on potential topics to cover, and we'd love your suggestions in the chat. We'd love um, your requests in the chat. I'll just say one more thing before um, moving to Alan on um, on the second question. Um, on, on complementarity with um, standing regional courts. Um, so there is very important jurisprudence, and Neshan mentioned this in his remarks as well, coming out of the regional court system, the inter-American system, the European court system, um, and to some extent, the African court system. Of course, that does not embrace the entire globe. There are significant um, geographic areas that are left out hence the movement for a world court of human rights. And while the ICJ is not bound by any of these decisions, it listens um, and it reads and it notes and it observes. Um, and as they form a customary international law or established precedent or established uh, jurisprudence that uh, enters the learned treatise area, um, the, the law moves forward. And so where, for example, you have the ICJ seized of a case on um, climate uh, change, where you have it loss that has come out with an opinion just a few months ago on similar matters in a maritime setting, and you have regional courts, both in the inter-American system and the European system, considering these questions, we have a corpus of law that's, that's developing. Um, and here to the question on the environmental court um, and being beyond the crime of ecocide, um, I think this, this, we, uh, we, we entertain the idea of the independent court while also heeding uh, the ambassador's words about not overloading the system um, with duplication and redundancy. There are a couple of other avenues for environmental justice that I think have not gotten as much attention as the independent crime of ecocide, um, which is that uh, environmental crimes are already um, embraced within the Rome statute as well as, uh, and the current prosecutor has made it his policy, a stated policy to more actively pros in, prosecute and investigate um, crimes uh, against the environment um, as war crimes. And so we hope to see that developing, I think, further. Alan, would you like to take that last question and then maybe um, you can give some final remarks and then I'll give a little bit of wrap up. Yeah, I think that this is what, with regards to small arms and light weapons and the flow of, of, of weapons uh, into areas which are fragile or are actually in conflict and how that is violating the human rights, uh, human rights to life first, uh, which is enshrined under the International Declaration on Civil and Political Rights, but also the right to peace, which is not really defined well yet with, as a human right. It is developing. Um, the, the right to peace has sort of been more at the international level and the responsibility uh, of the nation states to resolve their conflicts through peaceful means rather than recourse to armed conflict. But the, there has been a universal declaration on the right to peace, first in 1948, and then a follow-up one, which was negotiated. Um, it was, in our minds, what didn't go far enough, um, and there isn't yet, you know, like a, a full embodiment of this uh, in the international tribunals, but there are ways of taking this forward. 
Um, we don't yet have an international court of, of human rights, uh, but there is a human rights council. So there are opportunities for taking, criticizing governments for violating, you know, the right to peace with their production and circulation of small arms and light weapons through the Human Rights Council. So that's looking at the human right aspect. There's also a lot of work happening in the disarmament realm, which is not really uh, in the human rights world, but it, it relates very much to it. And there's an international campaign, IATSA, the International uh, Network of Small on Small Arms and Light Weapons, which is helping people to work on these issues um, and bring them to a fore. So it's it's not yet a, a fully fledged uh, legal judicial approach, you know, available as far as we would like. But there are elements in there. Um, one other thing to mention is that if this comes up through cases in, for example, the International Court of Justice we have seen the capacity of the International Court of Justice to look beyond just what's within the treaties, to look at customary principles of international law, including the right to peace. So we don't yet have a case on small arms and light weapons in the International Court of Justice, but it may come up with some of these other cases. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I, I know we're over time. We've tried to address a couple of um, uh, inquiries in the chat, including where to find um, Professor Trahan's book. Um, before I thank our esteemed panelists, I would like to point out that this is a time where our international courts and tribunals have never been busier. I think it was mentioned that the ICJ alone is currently seized of 24 cases, including an unprecedented number of advisory opinions. Considering that it has considered that is um, a contemplated 195 cases total since its establishment in 1945 and the lodging of the first case in 1947, you get a sense of exactly what that workload and that prolific output looks like, and also, also what the strain looks like on the institution, um, whose resourcing has not uh, increased commensurately. And the same could be said of the ICC, and the. I'm so glad that Ari mentioned how important it is that the Coalition for the International Criminal Court continues to work to ensure that civil society plays an active role um, in ensuring that that body can be as effective as it needs to be, that victims and survivors' voices are not only heard, but that the lessons learned are then applied in the jurisprudence of the court going forward and in its working methods. Um, and to that end, thank you again to, to Ulag um, for your really uh, important contributions here. Where we now have um, a, um, a, I think, contrast is between the amount of work and the um, uh, efficacy of these institutions. And I don't think we covered it as much in this session as we did in the earlier session, but even where um, courts refuse initially to recognize or implement or abide by the decisions of the ICJ, um, scholarship, including by Judge Weir Montre, and the last president of the ICJ, um, American judge Joan Donahue, shows that ultimately they lead to policy change. Um, at the same time that this is true, we also have international courts and tribunals that are under threat. And I would just like to end with a call to everybody here um, to join us in um, uh, our adamant belief um, and willingness to move forward with the notion that there is no room for intimidation of independent, autonomous institutions. We may not like their judgments, we may not like their decisions, their outcomes, we might not even like what they're prosecuting or investigating. But where jurists, prosecutors, um, uh, um, civil servants are facing uh, mounting challenges and intimidation, uh, sometimes to their personal safety, often to their ability to operate and achieve the promise of never again, to achieve the promise of a court for all humanity, um, that cannot be countenanced. And I say this coming to you from Washington, DC, um, as the co-convener of the Washington Working Group for the International Criminal Court. And if anybody would like to know more about how dangerous the threat of sanctions are on the court and its officials, um, we will put some information into the chat and I look forward to uh, speaking further. 
So um, rather than end on that rather dour note, um, I invite all of you, many of you have already joined the Legal Alternatives to War campaign and the Impact Coalition on Just Institutions and the International Court of Justice. But all of you who have not done so to do so, um, there is absolutely no obligation other than having wonderful discussions like these where we get to share wisdom. And we hope to have more news leading up to and after the Summit of the Future, um, which does represent a milestone and an opportunity, hopefully, for seismic change and the next evolution of international justice. Um, so with that, I'll conclude by thanking Neshan, Ari, Dr. Ula, Ambassador, and Professor Trahan. And for everybody who didn't get your questions answered, we'll do our best to try to follow up. Um, and with that, I think I will conclude the recording. And um, thank you all for spending so much time with us.